in the book of James. I'm looking forward to continuing the study here through the last two chapters. We've had a good study thus far. We welcome each of you here tonight. I welcome Brian's family, um, Evans and Bradley in the front row, and Tina, his wife, uh, Sandy over there. We welcome them tonight. They're, these are the technology guys, along with their dad, and uh, he's helping with the video, and I appreciate your being here tonight. Let's begin with a, with a prayer. God, we thank you for the blessings of this day. We are here because your spirit led us here. We're here, we believe, on assignment that you led us through the power of your spirit to gather together this group of people tonight to study your word. And we thank you for this book we're studying. It's a book of wisdom. And we thank you that we're learning from it. We pray that we'll listen as your spirit speaks to our hearts tonight. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Do you ever feel that your prayers are going unanswered? You prayed about something over and over and over again, and there just seems to be no answer. What plan of prayer does God respond to? Is there a way of praying that's more effective than any other way? Most of us would like to know the way to pray to get our answers the way we desire them. Well, I'm looking for something in specific. I just wish I had a way to pray to get this. Tonight, we're looking at the fourth chapter of James, as I mentioned. You recall at the end of last week's session, chapter 3, James was talking about peacemakers and being compassionate towards other people. And all of a sudden, he comes over into chapter 4 and starts talking about wars and fights and cravings and all these things. Quite a shift from where we were with him last week. Now, these are the things that actually hinder our spiritual growth and maturity. You remember we said that the book of James is about spiritual maturity, how, how mature spiritually in the world we live in. So tonight, we're going to be talking about productive praying and participating in God's will because James has more than one topic in the chapter. We're going to look at those. There's some principles for prayer that I think are very real and very valid. And God doesn't just answer prayers willy-nilly. He, he has a system that he has put into place, definite laws and rules and principles for productive prayer. And he says, you pray this way and you'll get an answer. So God answers our prayers. Many times we feel like we have prayed about something and struggled with that and sometimes the most important thing in all the world to us is just to get an answer from God. I was talking with a person today on the phone, and, and he said, I, I just would like an answer. He said, his mother was ill, she was in the hospital, threatened for her life, almost lost her two times already today, and she's in over our surgery. And I talked to him uh, down in Georgia, and he said, you know, I, I just, he said, well, I just, I wish God would just answer my prayer. I want to know what he's going to do with my mom. And I said, well, what you got to do is trust God no matter what God chooses to do with your mom. If God chooses to see her through the surgery, she lives, or if not, she just changes residence and goes right, mm -hmm. goes right on living because she's not going to die. Uh, she may die, her physical body may die, but she's not going to die. She just goes right on living. So we were talking about that, about how sometimes the most important thing to us is just to get an answer. Well, <coughs> we're going to look at a productive prayer plan, and that includes several things. And I'm going to show these to you. First of all, verses 1 and 2. It includes recognizing your need. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 of the fourth chapter of James. What is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from the cravings that are at war within you? You desire, do not have. You murder and covet, cannot obtain. You fight and war. You do not have because you do not ask. Here is a prayer principle. He just gives it right off the top. And that is, you will never get an unasked prayer answered. The one prayer you can be sure God will never answer is the one you didn't pray. So James says right up front, we struggle to get what we need. We, we don't ask God. So many times people have called me and say, look, said, look, I, I've tried everything else I know to do. Preacher, I thought we'd call you and see if you'd pray with us. We thought one last thing. I've had people talk to me about getting divorced. Well, one last thing, we'll try one last thing before we see the attorney. Will you pray with us? You know, and so many times we look at praying at the end of the road rather than at the beginning. And James says we ought to do that just the opposite. And so he says, stop warring and fighting and craving to get what you get. God just says, ask, and it'll be given. And so Jesus taught the same thing back in Matthew 7, 7, when he said, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching, you'll find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. The verb form there is interesting to me, the word, the, the, the word ask in both those passages uh, is ateo, uh, iteo, which means uh, that we are to ask. It's, it's like a parsable form. So it, it says that we are to ask and keep on asking. We continue to ask. 
our need is to ask God for what the need uh, is that we feel like that we want to have answered in our lives. And so it's like a demand that you won't give up on. You just keep on asking and asking and asking and asking. It's because it's not up to us. It's up to God. God doesn't really want us uh, to depend on ourselves. He wants us to depend on him. There's an illustration of a little boy I think is just so, it's so appropriate here. A little boy is trying to roll a huge stone along. And he was not doing much with that. Couldn't hardly turn it. And so his, his dad said, are you using all of your strength? And he said, yes, dad, I'm using all my strength. And his dad turned back to him and said, no, you're not using all your strength because you haven't asked me to help you. And so it's perfectly appropriate. How many times do we say, I'm doing the best I can? And God's saying, are you doing the best you can? Yes, I am, God. No, you haven't asked me yet. So when we haven't prayed, we haven't asked. So James says, stop to ask. We've got to ask. Recognizing the need and asking God and letting him respond to us. Now, notice in James verse 2, he describes a person who is struggling to get the needs that his life met. And he says that he fails because he's fighting and warring. What, he should, what should he have been doing? Should have been praying instead of fighting and warring. Should. That's the whole problem with, with, this, with this struggle he was going through. And so he says, if we use selfish desires, if that's what's motivating our request, then many times we're murdering, coveting, fighting, warring. If our motives are wrong, our actions will be wrong too. So we've got to, we've got to deal with not only the issue of, uh, of asking, which is the first principle, but a little bit more than that we're going to see in a moment. Now, selfish living and selfish desiring leads to selfish praying. So if I'm living selfishly, it's all about me, if I'm selfish in the things that I desire, what is my prayer life going to sound like? God, I want this. God, I need that. So we're praying selfishly. And so James says in verse 3, he gives us another principle here in his plan of prayer, and that is requesting with the right motive. He says, you ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your evil desires. So recognize the need is the first step, and then ask with the right motive, request with the right motive, because God does not answer until we get the motive right. That's what James is teaching. Not every prayer can be answered, uh, James says, because it's asked with the wrong motive. So if you've got a prayer you've been praying over and over and over again, examine the motive for the prayer. The word that James uses here is uh, kakos, which means wrongly, asking wrongly. He says you're asking for what reason? To spend it on yourself, he says, your own selfish desire. How many times in the prayer uh, do we pray something like, God, I really want this or that. God, I really could use this. God, if you just let me meet this person, if I could just get my a door, a door of opportunity open at this place, if I could just get this job, if I could just get a new friend. <laughs> See, and we're asking selfishly because we want, to, we want to spend that on ourselves. So why do you want the answer, James says, because you want to spend it on yourself in verse 4. Now he expands on this. Because he says, friendship with the world is, he uses the term ekthra in the Greek, it means enmity, or in, in the translation we're using, hostility. Uh, and so he says, uh, they, they, or they create hostility or enmity toward God. So, what's wrong with being a friend of the world then? Uh, God has put us in. You say, well, this is the world. God made the world. I, you know. Why is the world at odds with God? Why, why is my asking something that the world seems to be telling me all I ask? Why is that? Why does that put me at enmity with God? He's not talking here about the world as unsaved people. He's not talking here about the world, the world of nature, the natural world. He's talk, most of the time when the Bible uses the word world, it's talking about the world system. So what he's talking about is the system that the world is, the order of the system, the order that the world is living in. And that is a system that is always against Christ, it seems, because it is humanistic. Look at the humanistic philosophy of life today. Humanism has become a religion in this country. It is absolutely rampant across the country today. And that is set against Christ. The, the, the world that he's talking about, the system he's talking about, is an arrangement of things in his teaching. He says friendship with this world system is adultery, it's hatred, it's unfaithfulness to the bridegroom. Who is our bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus is. And so, if we're unfaithful faithful to the bridegroom, we are committing adultery, spiritual adultery is what he says. And so, again, humanism right at the heart of the issue. So many different ideologies, 
and philosophies of life. And, and humanism is, is so powerful an influence on the young people today, on the educational system of the country today, on politics today. Uh, we have seen evidence of that, I think over the last decade in our country, more than we've ever seen it before in our history. Fourth verse, another principle of praying, and that is reflecting true spirituality. Here's the, here's the answer to making our motives right. He says uh, in verse four, adulteresses, don't you know that friendship of the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. Now Jesus, we said, is the bridegroom. We're the bride, we're married to Christ in our spiritual lives, we'll be true to him. The world is like a harlot that we that is trying to seduce us to steal our love away from Christ. That's the world system he's talking about. And he says if we follow the world system instead of following Christ, we become spiritual adulterers. Now, we, he says we do that through our selfish ambitions because the world teaches us to be selfish, to look to ourselves, uh, to desire what you want. And when you do that, it becomes hatred and uh, obviously, it creates a struggle between us and the bridegroom, who is Christ. So when we're courting the world, we, can, we cannot count on God to answer our prayers. If we're having an affair with the world, living by the world system, following the world's uh, the desires the world puts before us, then why should God give us the strength to serve the world that's in competition with him, that's in opposition to him? It would be absolutely ridiculous. And so it, it would be to give strength to us to be unfaithful to him, and he wouldn't do that. So that's the reason James says we have to get our uh, motive right, and he says we do that by reflecting true spirituality. Now, I want to show you a little bit about that. When God gives us the strength and gives us the, the will and the leadership of the Spirit to pray correctly, we can pray correctly. So, jot into your notes, if you're a spiritual Christian, your prayers will not be hindered. If you're a spiritual Christian, how does that come about? How do we become spiritual Christians? How can we respond spiritually in a world that's so bent against Christ? I think the answer is important for us to, to grasp right here. We need to learn to pray in the Spirit. Now, I know that some people, some people think, well, we're well, about to get Pentecostal on us now. <laughs> no, what I'm about to do is get biblical on us here because that is a true teaching of the scripture. In fact, it's important because the Spirit of God knows how to pray so as to get God to answer our prayers. He knows exactly how to utter our requests so that God is able to answer them. So when we need to learn how to pray, we need to learn how to pray in the Spirit. Now, here is Paul's statement in Ephesians 6.18 that's a companion to James teaching. Ephesians 6.18, pray at all times in the Spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert in this with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. So we are not acting like spiritual Christians. When we take over our prayer lives, we control our prayer lives, we control the motives, we control what we're asking for. Who should be controlling those? The Holy Spirit in us. And the Holy Spirit in us uttering the quest, Christ making intercession for, for some of the quests is asked, is going to get answered. And we're going to see how important that is in just a moment here. So, again, we, we cannot control our prayers and use them to our self advantage, selfish advantage if we're letting the Spirit of God control us. And that's what he's, he's teaching here. Verse 5, another principle, and that is responding to the Holy Spirit's presence in us. Listen to verse 5 in chapter 4. Or do you think it's without reason the Scripture says that the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, who lives in us, yearns jealously? That's important. But uh, Paul in Romans 8, 26 Again, gives us a companion, companion verse. In the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And so he says, stop in your prayer and be quiet and allow the Spirit to ask the request the way it should be asked in keeping with God's will and God will answer when you're, when you're praying, you're, you're frustrated, and you're wringing your hands, well, God, it's going to seem to get an answer, it's going to seem to get an answer. Pause for a moment and say, God, I want to let your spirit, I just want to be quiet, and I want your Holy Spirit to intercede for me with groanings that, as the King James Version says, they can't be uttered. Learned that years ago and never forgotten that. And so we need to just be quiet and let the Spirit do the groaning before God because he'll present the request exactly 
because he is God himself, so he would know how to ask God so as to get the answer. He knows what the Father's will is. We don't know that. We're trying to discover that. And so God works according to his principles of prayer, but our prayers are not being answered simply because we're not following those principles. We need to learn to be aware of the Spirit's presence in us. He's always there. I've, I've heard people say, oh, I just, well, I looked, preacher, I looked up and I just shouted out, well, you don't have to shout to call, to call on God. You don't have to raise a big ruckus to do that. Why? Because he's in your heart. He's in your life. The Spirit of God is Christ in you. And so Paul says in Romans 8 9, if you want to jot that passage down, Romans 8 <coughs> 9, he, we know he lives in us. He says, because you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. And it, But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So James says, the Spirit yearns jealously. He desires jealously the, the devotion of our hearts. And when, he wants our full heart, our full life given to Christ. And he'll do whatever he has to do in our lives to keep us from committing this spiritual adultery James is talking about and helping us to love the bridegroom more. And that's what the whole book of James is about, is loving him more and becoming mature in him, that is, in Christ. So Paul says we are praying in the Spirit. He directs our prayers in such a way that they'll be answered. Now, praying in the Spirit means that we are praying in deep emotional fellowship and communion with God. We have gotten so close to Christ now, the Holy Spirit is recognized in us, and we're praying in the, we're releasing our prayer to the Spirit and letting Him utter the prayer for us. Praying in the Spirit means we're praying in cooperation with Him. And we're not praying in opposition to Him. The world is in opposition to Him, but we're not praying that way. We're letting Him prompt us in our prayer. Middle of jot down, praying in the Spirit means the Holy Spirit is initiating our prayer life. I like to think of it that way, in that He is showing me what to pray, and then He will show me how to pray and pray for me when I even cannot pray for it as I should. And so it means we're getting connected with the Spirit, and then we're beginning to pray as He controls what we feel and what we pray. Now, here's an example of how the Holy Spirit works not only in individuals, but it works in the life of a church as well. The Holy Spirit knows exactly what the will of God is for us as individuals, for our families, for the church here that we're a part of. So the Spirit in us prompts us and directs us, a whole group of believers, to pray in concert together, in harmony together, that the will of God will be done about a present situation. Now, what is a great example of what I'm talking about here that we ought to be doing this with presently? You've, you've heard the discussion about affiliating with the Lachlan Church, right? We heard about that all last Sunday. We'll hear about that more as far as the Tennessee Initiative. The Holy Spirit plays a role here. I, I can give you a good illustration you'll never forget when you sit in the worship center ever again because when you see Dennis Worley stand up, as a worship leader, listen, we have, what was it, I don't know, 300 voices in the choir uh, in, a, in a good uh, Sunday probably or more, and we've got a huge orchestra. Can you imagine if every one of those choir members started to sing in their own rhythm and leader and sing what they wanted to sing and the volume they wanted to sing it, and all the orchestra, all the instruments started playing their instruments, different kinds of music, different kinds of songs they wanted to play. Can you imagine what would happen? We would not have, we would, we would not, we would, have a cacophony of some kind. <laughs> we, we wouldn't have a harmony at all, would we? It would be a mess in the worship center on Sunday morning. So the conductor then, the one who's in charge, who's directing the whole thing, takes the whole thing in charge and everybody plays in the right rhythm and meter and the perfect time and perfect timing and perfect harmony with each other, every instrument playing exactly what they should be playing, and beautiful music comes out of all that, and we enjoy that and are blessed by that and worship God through that. Now, we're coming together as a church. We had the town hall meetings are being held, and then the church will vote over these next, I guess the one of the town hall meetings that already occurred, or maybe, maybe, maybe the only one, but I know we are voting over the next two or three Sundays now in a row. So we should all be praying. If we're letting the Spirit direct us, well, guess what? Every member, 10,000 members are praying for the same thing. If the Spirit of God's doing the praying. Now, if there's some people praying selfishly and saying, well, boy, I sure hope that the Lord doesn't need, the Lord doesn't need us to do this. If he leads to do that, they're going to ask for more money to do that with. Or, you know, some people may be praying, well, I sure hope they do this because we want to have our church to have a, you know, opportunity to be successful too. And 
No, no, we, we should not, we, we shouldn't be voicing our opinion. We should be asking the Holy Spirit to direct our praying so that we are all praying in concert. And when we vote, we will vote in concert and we'll vote the will of God because it will be God who directed us and not us choosing what we want uh, in, in the matter. I thought that was a great illustration. So we're right in the middle of that. It's a good illustration of what James is talking about here. Now, this, the sixth verse, it gives us another uh, principle, and that is we are to return to the Father's purpose. We, we, we must return to his purpose for our lives. He gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So we, we don't want to be like this person that James has been talking about who is warring, murdering, and coveting all of this. We shouldn't try to do it ourselves. We want to let God do it. Let God come alongside of us. Let him live his life through us. Lord, I can't do what you want me to do, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We say as individuals, we should say the same thing as a church. So God resists the proud. The word, the word he uses there is antipasso, which means opposed to resist. It's like a military term that means to battle against, to war against. And so in this case, it is the proud person. James says God battles against the proud person. He is not for them. He is not hearing their prayers. He's not going to respond to their prayers. But he says, God gives grace to the humble. Now, this is about our submitting to the authority of Christ in our lives. The cure for, for this conflict and this warring and this taking charge, it's got to be my way. The pride, prideful spirit is a humble spirit. God isn't interested in listening to us pray to try to change his will. How many times have we said, God, if you could please, if, I've heard people pray publicly, if God, if you just find it in your will, if you just would, just please, just, you know, asking God, please change. No, genuine prayer submits to God's will. It doesn't ask God to come over on our side. It says, God, I'm going to join you. Remember, the world fell when Adam said what? Not your will, but my will. And then when uh, the second Adam came, Christ, what did he say? Not my will, but your will. He got it right, you see. Uh, and so the disciples' prayer, he even says that. He says, when you pray, you ought to pray, your kingdom come, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. So we've got to find God's will to get the center of that is what James is talking about here. And then the seventh verse, another principle here in uh, praying, and that is relying on the Son's power. He says, therefore, submit to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So when we pray in the way James is laying out here, Jesus empowers us to stand against Satan and win against Satan. That's interesting to me. Uh, in fact, why would he insert this statement right here in this particular passage? If you're trying to pray according to God's plan, what's going to happen? The devil's going to do what? He's going to oppose you. <laughs> He's going to oppose you. He'll attack you. You're exactly right. In fact, you, you, how many times have you tried to pray and, uh, and, and the phone rings. Mm -hmm. Or you, you set aside a time to pray and uh, the text alert goes off. Or the email alerts, four of them in a row <laughs> go off. Uh, or sometimes you, you say, well, I'm just going to shut myself off. I, I've had times when I go into my office at home, shut the French doors on the office and say, I'm, just, I'm, you know, I'm absolutely going to be quiet in here. And it's, I tell you, it's like the devil comes in through the little bitty hole in the, in the little place we use the little device to shake open a passage lock, it's like he breaks into that. <laughs> he, he finds a way to get in, doesn't he? And he always seems to attack us. And uh, you try to pray, your mind drifts on a hundred things. It's hard to keep your mind on something like we're doing here tonight. It's hard not to think about tomorrow, what you got to do tomorrow. What you got to wash the, you got to do the wash tomorrow, you got to do the, uh, some, uh, take care of something to the laundry, you got to do this at the office, you got to do that. Uh, in, in, uh, in my social life, I'm at an appointment tomorrow, I got to see the doctor, all those kinds of things. Got to clean up the yard tomorrow. Got to clean it. Got to do this. And if y'all think about those things, we ought to be focusing on our prayer. You say, well, that's not the devil doing that to us. I, I want to tell you, if it's not the devil, he's sure assisting in it. <laughs> because he is warring against us. And so God says, stop, listen. Listen to me. Don't listen to what the devil has to say. That's what he says to us. And so what we need to be thinking about is not what we're doing tomorrow, but focusing on what God wants us to do right now. In fact, Satan put into Judah's mind to betray Jesus. You say Satan can't put something into your mind 
He surely can, all kinds of things. The devil doesn't want us to pray. Why doesn't he want us to pray? Because prayer is spiritual warfare. And he knows if he can catch us off guard, that he can attack us and he can overcome us. So we should always pray for God to put on us his full armor when we come to the prayer closet. I've learned to do that. When I start to pray, the first thing I say is, God, I want to put on the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth going around my loins, and my feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I put them all on me. In fact, let your Holy Spirit pour from within me while your armor guards me on the outside because I'm about to pray. I pray a lot when I run. And when I'm running, I pray that. I pray that God put the armor. Sometimes the devil will try to harass me and get my thoughts off the prayer. And I'll pray, God, you need to tighten the armor just a little bit. <laughs> Cause they, because that's a struggle. I, I never will. And listen, this is not something. We, listen, we shouldn't be trying to chase the devil away from us. That's what James is getting at here. Listen to his statement again. Submit to God, but resist the devil and he'll flee. Now get this. I, I watched the televangelist a few years ago on TV. And he was preaching. He was all up into, into himself, I think, more than anything else. And, uh, and he was talking all about how you know you had to war against the devil, spiritual warfare, and spiritual combat. And then he said, he said, in fact, I'll demonstrate this right. He said, I'll show you right now. He said, the devil's in here right now. And so he starts running up the aisle. And he said, I'm chasing him out of here right now. He gets to the door and he kicks his foot up as if to kick the devil out of the worship center, slams the door behind him, says, there, devil, you're, you stay out of here now. And I thought to myself, man, the devil is all over you. The devil has you around the neck and you don't even realize it. You know why? Because he was going at it all the wrong way. The word here that James uses is hupotasso, which means to submit to. And so the, the passage could read, submitting yourselves therefore to God. That's the step. We're not to war against the devil. We don't have any armament that we can use to fight him. We can't defeat him on our on, with our, in our own strength. But prayer is part of our armor. All this armor we can put on to protect us from the evil one. But what we need to do is simply submit to God. And when we submit to God, what does he do? I used to say down in Georgia, all you see when you submit to God in Georgia, all you see is the clay dust of the heels of the devil when he kicks it up when he's leaving. Because he wants no part of prayer. You submit yourself to God and the devil will flee from you. And that's what he So first submit to God, then resist the devil and he'll flee. But we need to get that right. Too many people are doing that wrong these days. Uh, particularly, you know, some of the more flamboyant speakers want to try to make a big deal out of, you know, fighting and kicking the devil out. Well, if you try that, you'll lose every single time because you'll lose. You're never going to be stronger than he is. But you are stronger in Christ. When the Spirit of God takes over and the Spirit is in control and you submit to God first, then, listen, the devil wants you to fight because you're impotent to win against him. But when we fight in the power of the Spirit, when we respond to God and let God take over, and let, when we submit to God, he resists the devil, and the devil responds to his authority and his power, not to ours. So that's a key uh, principle. Then the eighth verse, another principle, remaining accountable to the Father is part of the process. Draw near to God. This is another prayer principle. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hand centers. Purify your hearts, double-minded people. So we can't really remain close to the world and draw near to God at the same time. We've got to come away from the world in order to draw near to God. So you want to put it in the notes, we have to consciously and with intentionality, because I think if you don't do it intentionally, you won't do it. With intentionality, draw near to God. That means choose decisively. It's impossible to hold up holy hands before God if we've been tempered in the world. So what James says is that we've got to separate ourselves from the world and uh, you say, well, what happens? I, if I sin against God, what do I do? Lose my relationship with God? Absolutely not. Sins don't cause us to lose our relationship with God, but they do adversely in, in impact and interrupt our fellowship with God. So the fellowship is destroyed, but not the relationship. The psalmist said, uh, if I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would have not listened, would not have listened. Psalm 66, 18. He said, if I think of my sins, that's going to block out between me and God. I, I'll, 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 I'll be afraid to even approach God. And so James says we are not to be double-minded. Double-minded, he's talking again about this relationship we have with Christ. We're married to him. So he says don't, don't commit spiritual adultery with the world. And so you say, well, how, how can I, if I've been doing that, if I've been letting other things in the world dominate my thinking, <coughs> 
And so I haven't been praying correctly, and I've been trying to war against the devil myself, and I need to change that pattern. How can I do that? The answer is in these thoughts, and I want you to take time to get this down. We are to confess our unfaithfulness. Confess our unfaithfulness. What does confess mean? I mean it means to agree with. Agree with God. <coughs> confess it with our mouths. We agree with. And secondly, turn from it as part of it. And that's an about face. We're walking one way, we do an about face, and we head in the other direction. And that's what he's talking about. So we confess our unfaithfulness, we turn from it, then we receive God's forgiveness, which he guarantees he'll do every time. And then, what do we do? Get back under the Spirit's control again. Allow the Spirit of God to control us. That's, that, is, that is such an important thing for us to learn. Uh, is, again, the not being drunk with wine, but being controlled by the Spirit. And that means uh, having Him to control life, our attitudes, our actions, our thoughts, and our motivations. Well, look in the ninth verse, we see another prayer principle, and that is writing our attitude before the Father. He says, be miserable and mourn and weep. Your laughter must change to mourning and your joy to sorrow. Now, what has he just been talking about? He's been talking about the prideful, haughty person, right? The, the prideful person that, that, that feels like that, that, you know, that he wants to be in charge of his own life. Now he says, instead of having that attitude, what should our attitude be? We should mourn, not be half-hearted, not be frivolous, not be foolish. <coughs> Many of our prayers fall into the category of foolish praying or praying outside of the will of God, James says, no, 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 let the Spirit of God utter them for you. Get it back in line with the will of God. Confess when you have taken over control of your own life. But very few of our prayers fall into the category of those where we would say we have gone in before God and fallen down and wept, literally, over the circumstances. I tell you, when things get bad enough in life, the wheels come off of it enough, you'll find a place and get on your knees, right? Because, it, you know, it's like I saw my friend today when his mother was in, in uh, surgery, and he was... He was humble. You know, he's normally a guy who's up and running and got a hand grip on things that he feels, you know, he's in charge. But boy, today he was saying, I just need a prayer right now. I need you to pray with me because I'm, I, I just really am at, just at my wit's end. Don't know what to do about mom. What, what should we do? What can we do? Well, fasting is one of, the, one of the reasons we fast is to show us that we're serious about something in prayer. Fasting shows us that we're serious about our prayer requests. Now, fasting is not for God. Some people think it's for God, so you know, you know I, in fact, some people, will, some people kill the whole process of the fast when they fast, and then they try to look as beaten up and, and uh, horrific when you see them. You say, well, I know you've been fasting because you look like you just lost a ton of weight, and you, right? you look so pale. And that, No, listen, but we're supposed to get up, shave, and... and Fix our hair and look our look decently, and men and women put on the put on your face in the morning, as they say, and uh, and look your best when you're fasting. It's not because we're not doing it for somebody else; we're doing it for ourselves to show ourselves before God, because God already knows are we serious. Now we've got to show ourselves we're serious. The writer in, in Ecclesiastes says, "There is a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and we need to learn that." We don't mourn enough and weep enough before God. I want to tell you right now, Americans, this is the time to be mourning. Of all the times in the history of this country, I think more than any other time, we need, the, the Cold War is not over. In fact, it has worsened and gotten colder in the last seven years plus. The end of the age almost seems like it's drawing near because you see more and more signs of things happening. You say, well, surely, Lord, I'm, I'm with John. If he were to say he's coming tonight, I'd say, I'm in even so come, Lord Jesus, because, you know, because it, you know, it, is, it is that at that point. So we need a right attitude with repentant hearts, with mournful spirits. We need to get before God and pray. There's too much merrymaking in the country, too much foolishness and craziness, even in the election that's going on right in front of us. And not enough asking God, seeking God's will. What does God want? Uh, in fact, I think that you know, if we if we all just turned off our TVs and got on our knees, we'd be better off to find what the will of God is for whom we should pray in the election. So God is looking for contrition and confession in those that He'll bless. He says, if you're contrite, you come before me humbly and uh, have a, a contrite spirit and confess your sins, then I'll hear you. Well, we've seen eight principles now. 
of how to have a productive prayer plan for our lives. Those are important. Now, we're going to look at a second thing that James addresses here, and that is a proper self-appraisal. Because this is getting us out of the pride mode, out of the pride motion and into a humble motion. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he'll exalt you. Don't criticize one another, brothers. Who you criticizes a brother or judges his brother criticizes the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Oftentimes we'll say, the way up is down. You know, get on your knees. When you get far enough down where you're so low that you can't do anything but pray, then God will lift you up, those kinds of things. <clears throat> the lowly one becomes the lifted up one. Jot this in your notes. When we are willing to be humbled, we are surely, we're surely, we will surely be brought to honor. Now, let me tell you, even as I say that, let me tell you this. It is dangerous to ask God to humble you. That is, not, that is probably a path you don't want to go down. <laughs> I wouldn't want to ask God to humble me because, I, because if you ask, God will do it. The better way is to say, I'm going to weep over my sins. Spiritually, I'm going to turn to God as we've just seen, and I'm going to walk in the power of God's Spirit once again. Listen to the psalmist as he says, The Lord is near the brokenhearted. He saves those crushed in spirit. So I want to tell you, brokenhearted is a good place to be. And don't run away from that. If you are mournful in your spirit because of the circumstances in your life, take full advantage of that. Sometimes that is the time God is wanting to do his greatest work in your life. If we obey God's instructions, draw near to him, he says he'll cleanse us and forgive us, and then we won't be at war with him anymore. Now, here's verse 12. He says, learn to live humbly, and the way you do that is let God be the judge. Now, that's so, so important in our relationships, not only with each other, but in our relationship with God. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? So God is the only one who's above the law. God gave the law, only he could change the law or delete the law. In fact, he uses a word here, nomothetes, uh, it means to set in place. God constituted the law. God gave the law to Moses. It hadn't been changed. Uh, the, the, the Ten Commandments can be placed wherever they want to place them. We know they're in our hearts. We know, uh, in fact, he says here as he goes on uh, that God is, is, he wrote it, put it in place, he says, and he says, the word is kretes, it means that God is the, not only the lawgiver, but God is the judge of those who break the law. It's God's place to judge, not ours. That should pretty much silence our judgmental actions and our judgmental thoughts toward others, shouldn't it? It's so easy. To, uh, to have hateful thoughts towards someone. James asks a rhetorical question here. He says, who are you to judge your neighbor? The expected answer is, nobody. I don't need to be doing that. It's, it's wrong for me to judge. I, I shouldn't be judging. And so that's what all the book of James is about. It's about helping us to, uh, to rec recognize we have no right to boast and to brag. Uh, we, we shouldn't belittle and judge other people. The judgment we use will be used on who? On us. So we want to avoid that. And then the final thing he talks about in the chapter is a plan to live in the will of God. Because if we're in the will of God, the prayer is going to be answered. So obviously this is an important topic as he comes to conclude the chapter. In verse 13 down to verse 14. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business there and make a profit there. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be, for you are like smoke that appears a little while and then vanishes. In verse 16, then he says, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So he says, now let, let's look at what this involves. He says, today, you say, today, I'm going to do this. I'm going to travel here, travel there, do this, do that. I, I think about our younger son who travels most weeks. In fact, this week's a good example. Left on Monday, flew back in late last night, uh, spoke to him briefly today, flies out tomorrow, be gone the rest of the week, and a lot of his weeks are like that. He's, he's looking at whatever possibilities God has in store for him right now because that is a killer kind of schedule to try to keep. You hardly have time to know yourself, much less a family and, and all the other things you got to juggle in life, parenting and other responsibilities. And certainly it's hard for a person who's doing that kind of thing to keep his focus in life and his priorities in order. 
because you're simply serving the people for whom you work. And, and I'm not saying, you know, I know we all have tended to do that along the way in life, and it's easy to get into that trap. But what James is talking about here is that life is complex. It involves a lot of things, he says. And the only way to survive this uh, is through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, he's, so finding and doing the will of God is important. So we should be saying, if God wills for me to travel here or travel there and do this and do that, I'll do it. It's not because I'm just going to get up and go do it. That's arrogant. It's like the guy that, you know, built his bigger barns and, you know, I'm just, a, you know, I'm just going to kick back and eat, drink, and be merry. I, you know, I, I don't, I'll live a long time. I've got all I need. I don't have to worry about anything. And God says, oh, tonight your life will be, will be required of you. So the universe is threatening if we're not trusting. All that's going around us will just run us over, threaten us, and take us over and, and basically destroy our lives. Uh, and so the only way to counteract that is to trust in God and say, God, if it's your will, I will do this or do that. Verse 14, life is also chancy. Uh, businessmen who make their plans for a whole year in advance kind of do that. I mean, if per chance, it's a chancy thing. They don't know. They, they plan 365 days out in the future. We don't know what. He said today or tomorrow, uh, we'll go here and go there and make a profit. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 1, don't boast about tomorrow for you don't know what a day might bring. We have no idea. Boy, if you were here last Sunday morning, you got a good understanding. We got that in last group and in the worship service. I went out of the worship service and said, my Lord, have mercy. I'm seven years old. I made it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seemed, I was like, boy, that's a, that's a wake up call, isn't it? You understand what I'm saying? Well, Luke 12, listen to this. I just referred to it. I'll do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night is the, your life be demanded of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be then? And that's how it is with the one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. It's chancy money. I've been, I've begun to pray. You know, I've had an opportunity when, to, to lead a lot of people to Christ over the years and baptize a ton of people and you know and, and touch a lot of lives. And I understand all that. But boy, the older I get and the shorter the span in front of me looks to me, the more I keep saying, God, you gotta put somebody in front of me today that's lost and without Jesus because I need to win somebody to Christ because I want to send along some more treasure to heaven where it counts. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm concerned about, obviously, the guy who handles the financial dealings for Sandy and myself in another state. And uh, you know, I, always, I, I always want to make sure he's, you know, I pray for him every day and for his two sons who are now working with him. I was their chaplain when they were on the football team. These little guys are making the same amount of money now. You know, I think of, wow. You know, but I do have all the comments in the world in them. They're great people and they're good people and we trust them completely. But I pray for them every day. They can't make a mistake because I got so much prayer on them. It would be hard for them to make a mistake <laughs> unless the crash finally comes. But at any rate, God says that uh, he has our days numbered. God has our days numbered. Remember that it's not for us. Don't have to worry about that. Now, if if... if if God were to say, you'd say, well, I wish God would tell me how many days I got left. I don't want to know how many days I got left. I'd either be so ecstatic, I wouldn't be any good to anybody, or I'd be so depressed, I couldn't live through the next day. You understand what I'm saying? Well, we don't want to know. Not our day. So only when we are in his will can we be confident of our tomorrows. When I'm doing what God wills, when I'm letting him lead me, he'll lead us where he wills. Let's notice that also he says life is compressed. For you are like smoke that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Sandy and I have been talking a few, the last few days. She found some pictures of the earlier dating life and marriage and so forth. And I, I, said, I said, I can remember that like yesterday. I, you know, I, sometimes I want to say, God, if you just put me back there and let me do it. And God says, Man, if I put you back there, you'd make the same mistakes again. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to waste my time with that. But you think sometimes, oh my goodness, it's, it's, and, but James says, that, you know, and I think, my, it doesn't seem like but a snap of a finger from there to where I am now. It seems like just yesterday that we got married. And then we had the two kids born and then the families and the grandkids. And all this has happened 
in 47 and a half years of ministry and all of that, and it seems like a blur. And James said, that's because life is compressed. It's like smoke. It's like a vapor on the hills in the morning, the, the mist on the ground in the morning. It's there. It's, as soon as the sun hits it, it's gone. And that's the way life is. And so we, we sometimes think of it, we think of our lives in terms of years, our birthdays, oh, another year. I've lived so many years. And James says we should count, we, we count not our day, we should count our, not our lives by birthdays, but by days. I'm, I'm going to live today because our days are go by so quickly. It's Friday and you say, my, it's Wednesday, and you say, where did, I just, we were just here Sunday. And then before you know it, you snap your finger, I'll be down in Georgia with Sandy and the kids are there. Well, they're going down too where I'm marrying a couple. With the, my IT guy from the church, I pastor, the second grade teacher from the, the uh, school that we have, Christmas school we have. And, and they've been dating for seven years and God has finally convinced them this is the right thing to do. So I think I shared that last time I was here. You, you, you gotta understand, I'm gonna go do this wedding. <laughs> <laughs> because God has led in that. I want to be a part of that. So, uh, so, but before we snap our fingers, we'll, we'll have gone down there and done that and we'll be back here. See, that's the way that happens. Life happens that way. We need to be investing in some things that are eternal and not just temporal. And so, we ought not to be so much listening to mentors and life coaches and other people, all those have, although they have their place. God's word has the best counsel for how to plan and live life successfully. If you want to know how to live, you don't need to pay somebody so many dollars an hour to tell you how to live. You need to get in the Bible and learn. Uh, so life is compressed. It's chance is compressed. It's also controlled by God. Verse 16. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Why? We boast to do what? To cover up our weaknesses and our mistakes. Thomas Kemp said, man proposes, God disposes. You know, if you make your plans ahead of God without asking him first, God disposes of them. He's not interested in your plan. He's interested in his plan for your life. And so we have to, we have to depend on the one who controls the future because God is in control. It's like the, the old song, uh, I know who holds tomorrow. And we all remember that as we, we sing that. And that's what James is talking about. We sin, he says, when we arrogantly boast about what we'll do. Uh, it's, a, it's foolish to ignore God's will in the, in the whole thing. We get serious when it seems to get dark, when we don't understand things. I, 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 interesting, interesting illustration. A, a guy, a group of people were going to in Kentucky to a mammoth cave. And they were with a guy. And the guy took them out of the cave. And all of a sudden, the lights went out. And everything got dark. And the guide said, uh, stay close to your guide. That's a five-word sermonette. And I guarantee you, nobody missed that. Because when it went dark, everybody wanted to be close to the guide. We need to stay close to God because he's our guide through life. In verse 17, then he talks about these two future possibilities for concerning God's will. One is choosing to obey the will of God. And we're going to look at verse 15 for that. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or do that. Doing what is good is doing God's will. It always is. The, the good thing. So I want to do what's the best thing. Do God's will. That's, that's it. Now, many people have asked me, how do you discern God's will? I want to give you five ways that I have found in my life that God helps me to discern his will. I want to make sure you get these down. And so we're going to, uh, to look at those. Um, Ways of building. First of all, through prayer. Get on your knees. That's where it starts. And let the Spirit out of the prayer. Let the Spirit ask what you need to know about His will for your life. Second thing is Bible study. Because I think Bible study is instructive. You say, well, that has absolutely nothing to do with the 21st century. Yeah, it has everything to do with the 21st century. It's, it's irrelevant as it was when it was written. And so we need to hear what the Scripture says. And then the counsel of Christian friends. I wouldn't seek counsel of somebody who's not trusting in God and seeking God's counsel and wisdom and he doesn't have godly wisdom to give you. So the counsel of Christian friends. And then the voice of God's spirit is another way that he instructs us on his will. And I think that's very, I think that the spirit of God just quietly bears witness, the scripture says, with our spirits of what he's, what he's teaching us. And then this is, a thing, this, most people miss this, the everyday ordinary circumstances of life. Back in the Old Testament, the prophet was asking God, what's your will for your people Israel? 
And he kept asking God, show me your will, show me your will. And God said, get up and go about your business as usual. <laughs> no, 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 well, I'll give me some seer, some great person I can go and talk with. And mm, God didn't do that. God said, go on over to the potter's house. And I know what you normally do, go over and watch the potter turn at his wheel. And so he goes over and watches the potter turn at the wheel. And what happens? The clay flies off the wheel. He goes and picks it up, puts it back, and begins to knead the clay. And he turns the wheel again. And God said, what you're seeing that potter do with that clay is exactly what I'm going to do with my people. I'm going to remold and remold, remold and remake and shape them. And so what he was doing was learning through the everyday, ordinary circumstances of life. One of the great ways God speaks to you. He opens doors and closes doors for us. Now, everyday, ordinary circumstances, very important, don't forget those. Paul says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you can discern... What is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God? Discern there means uh, that God wants us to discern it. God's not trying to hide his will behind the rock somewhere. He wants us to know what his will is. God designed and created us and did it for a purpose. Every one of us in this room, God made for a specific purpose. Now, this is interesting to me. Today, we're told from the humanistic philosophy of life, you need to get away and find yourself. You know, you look look within and you'll find the answer. Look to yourself, you'll find the answer. No, no, no. Paul, when God arrested him on the Damascus Road with a blinding light, two questions he asked. One, he didn't say, Lord, who am I? Tell me who I am so I can know what I need to do. Who did, what did he say? He said, who are you, Lord? So he asked the right question. Who are you? And once he found Christ, then he said, what will you have me to do? Because he got it. He understood it's not finding yourself that helps you find your way in life. It's finding Christ who knows what the purpose is. He's the creator. In fact, I think he speaks everyone into being that comes not only Adam and Eve, but everyone that's followed since then. And so we are all made for purpose. And we ask, Lord, let me know who you are. I need to know you. And once we know him, now what do you want me to do? Because he has the plan. And then verse 17, choosing to disobey God's will is the, is the opposite. And this is what we don't want to do. So James says, so it is a sin for a person who knows to do what is good, that is the will of God, and does not do it. And so there are things about which we know God's will that we simply choose not to do. That's what James, we make a mistake when we do that. God, God will only reveal as much of his will to us as he knows we will obey. See, he doesn't just throw it all out there for us. I, I like to see God's will in my life as sort of a scroll, the, like the scrolls in the Old Testament times, and, and, and they, were, they were unrolled. And you don't, we, you don't just flip the page open. People want to God to flip the book open. Well, there's your will. Oh. No, God says, I'm going to unroll it like a scroll, and I'm going to unroll a little bit of it. When you do that, I'll unroll a little bit more of it. When you do that, I'll unroll a little bit more of it. You do that, I'll unroll some more. And that's the way God reveals his wills. James says it's a sin for us to see what God's revealing to us. Where does he reveal it? In the scripture. But in these other ways that we've just seen, four other ways. And so God reveals his will, and look at this. God will not show you more of his will till you're already doing what you already know to do. I've had people come to me and say, boy, Brian, I want you to pray with me because i got a job opportunity I need so much. I need you to pray with me that God will show me what's the right job, what's the right decision to make about this. And with some of them, I knew that they were out of step with God's will in several areas of their lives, and I, I, I didn't want nothing charitable, but I wanted to say, you know, the first thing you need to do is do what you already know to be God's will because if I ask him to do this, he's not going to do that for you because you're not doing what you already know to do. Do that, and God will show you. And so, he's after this whole pride thing. Um, now, let me, let me get into, you get your job this down. Man has accomplished what God has permitted him to accomplish. We look at our world, and James says, don't live by pride, don't be prideful. Boy, I think of the great explosion of knowledge in this day and these generations. The space age pales in comparison to what Man in the areas of genetics and stem cell research is now doing the possibilities for finding cures for horrific diseases. I talked to a very noble scientist recently, a guy who is, who is involved in some of these studies and who's doing some spectacular procedures. In fact, he can't even do them 
uh, and some of those in this country because the FDA won't approve what he's doing, but he has to go out of the country to treat people and they're being healed, there are cures, and incredible things that God, listen, that's not them doing that, it's God doing that through them, so James says don't get arrogant about what God does through you. If he uses you in a powerful way, give him the glory for it. And, and so, then uh, part of the reason we disobey God's will is this pride thing, and then also ignorance of the nature of God's will. And James says both those are a problem. It's a sin for a person who knows what is good and then doesn't do it. Now, when we refuse to do God's will or we choose not to do God's will, look, Doing God's will is not an option, it's an obligation. And if you don't get that done, you're in trouble. God chastens those he loves. The writer in Hebrews says that well in Hebrews 12, and you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or faint when you are reproved by him for the Lord. Discipline's the one he loves, punishes every son he receives, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons, for what son is there a father does not discipline? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is if the father loves his kids, he's going to discipline his kids. So God is, God's chastening then is proof of his love. Shows us he genuinely cares for us. And then a companion to that thought, you may want to jot this down, we can also lose rewards in heaven because of disobeying God's will. It has consequences. So many people think, well, why can just disobey the will of God? It doesn't matter. No, no. If we miss God's will, we miss out some of our rewards. I know all about you, but I want to have a reward in heaven. I, you know, some people say, I'll be glad just to be a doorkeeper in heaven. Why do that when you can be, when you have all the riches and glory in Christ available to you? And so, we need to discipline ourselves and bring it under control, as Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 9. Bring it under control so that Paul said, after preaching, I hope and pray that I will not myself be disqualified. So, we're to obey God's will, and, and we're not going to miss heaven if we don't do that but we will miss rewards in heaven if we don't. That's what James is getting at. We're to demonstrate that we are maturing in Christ, and we do that when we do the will of God. This is a book about maturing in Christ, so when we do the will of God, we're demonstrating that we are maturing uh, in Christ. So, he's talked about productive praying, he's talk, talked about uh, participating in God's will, uh, and then he's talked about these different um, consequences of doing or not doing the will of God and how it finally comes out for us. The future possibilities concerning the will of God, are we going to be obedient or not? And he spells that out so clearly for us. What a good study and what a challenge to our hearts and minds. Chapter 4 is, you all have been patient. I, you, we, we had to cover a lot of material because I showed I only had five Wednesdays to do this and so it's required I'm moving much more rapidly. I could break these down and preach ten sermons from each chapter because there's so much wealth of material here. But in this study, this is a Bible study, an exposition of the passage, and that's what I agreed to do, and we, we just need, needed to move through them more quickly. So we have one more chapter, chapter 5. We'll be doing that next Wednesday night, God willing, as James said. And I look forward to your being with that. Let's share a prayer. Father, thank you for teaching us tonight by the power of your Spirit. You're a great teacher. You have written the book. You teach through the power of your Spirit. You judge when we fail based on the teachings of the Lord. We thank you for the scripture that was given by inspiration of your spirit and for his inspiration in us and for his presence in us to help us utter our prayers correctly and for Christ interceding for us at your right hand. It is our prayer in his name. Amen.